Hello everybody, so this is our first part where I'm actually going to draw our monitor. So what I've done, if you watched the first part, the prologue, you would have seen me, um, well I would have, I should have, well I would have showed you the um, kind of my process of how I start this off. So if you're new to this, this is a custom piece that I am drawing. So it's completely drawn from scratch. I am using um, references to assist me in ensuring that I'm getting the proportions correct, um, that I'm getting the colors correct. But in terms of actually drawing it, it's been drawn completely but from scratch. To make sure I do that well, and also so I don't screw this uh, surface up, I draw it first by hand in just from paper, pen, with a pencil. Once the client's happy, I then go into Photoshop and I'll sketch it up in Photoshop a bit more accurately with the actual dimensions that, I'll, that I want to be using. And then we can tweak colors, we can look at backgrounds and be a little bit more diverse. So for instance, once I had the background, uh, sorry, the main thing sketched up, I tried to show a few different options for background. Client had a rough idea, but he still wasn't too sure. So what he did was he, um, we put it to my Facebook page and got people to um, comment and give their opinions of what they liked. And we went with from there. So we narrowed it down to three that we liked. And then he's picked one. And then I'll be doing the background probably, probably in pan pastels. I haven't 100% set, uh, set my eyes on what or how I'll be doing it. But yeah, to get the outline you're looking at down, what I then did was I transferred the line by tracing what I had previously drawn. And that way I, it just goes down as one line and I'm not wasting... Well, it's not about wasting. I'm not destroying the paper and ruining it by constantly erasing and... Um, fixing errors and things like that so yeah um, if you've got any questions I feel free to ask them in the comments and if I see them before I um, do the next video I'll try and answer them in the next video otherwise I'll just respond if I can but yeah so I'll just chat to you what I'm doing now so I'm just working on his eye I've got a few reference photos um, I've been look I've got that um, I'll show you what they look like here and I'll link where I got them from down below in the description so these were sent to me from in an Instagram user and I've had a few people on Facebook also send me some photos which was really nice of them um, once people saw that I was looking at doing a emerald tree monitor which was lovely so with these eyes, some of the photos was actually quite difficult to see the eye. So I'm taking a lot of inspiration from my friend's lace monitor who's got a very orangey kind of eye. But then I was able to see a bit of that orange colour in quite a few of the photos that I was seen, uh, shown, sorry. So we're going with an orange eye. So what I'm doing here is I'm alternating between a range of different coloured pencils to layer it up. I did an experiment at the start, which I explained in the last video, the prologue about which pencils I've discovered layer up best on this surface. And then that's assisting me in knowing how to go about doing it here. Okay, so now I'm just doing a bit of the outline of his eye, or her eye. I haven't decided if we're going to make this one a boy or a girl. Now, so I'm still going to go over the orange bit, but what I'm going to now do is look at the pupil. I'm going to work out, um, so I'm going to have lots of light around here. So the idea is there's going to be patchy shadows coming through. So we'll do one shadow here. And the, eye, the, the thing is, to make an eye look shiny, you want to show a little bit of that reflection coming through. So I'm just trying to think how I can do that. So I'm going to alternate between these. This is Arctic in the Derwent Light Fast, so not a white. So I think the best way to do it is just kind of almost draw in the reflections of the jungle around this guy. So it's a green, it's white. Okay, I might do a touch of 
bit more obvious green. Just a touch, just a really small amount. Not a heap, I can always go over it again. So I'm going to come back out again. This one's light aqua, that's a bit too dark. Okay, now what I'm going to do is, because I haven't 100% made my, my mind up, I sort of do this as I go. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to very lightly do a grey, very lightly. Now I'm going to get a darker brown and I'm just trying to think the best way to do it. What I'll do first before, I'll, oh no, I'll do it first. There's going to be a lot of me changing my mind. This is what happens with custom pieces when it's, there's no photo to go off. I'm sort of kind of making it up as I go along. So we're going to do a little ring in here, but I'm stopping where that highlight's going to be. I'm then going to get a black. So this, I'm using, the, I've decided to go with the luminance black. I may change my mind and get the uh, Derwent drawing black. Okay, so I'm just doing a very fine outline on the outside of that brown I just put down. Now I'm going to do a dark section here. So this is where I'm making it up as I go along. I'm just sort of trying to work out what looks best. So a little dark bit here, because the idea is this entire section is going to be the pupil. But as the viewer, when you see a washed out bit, your brain accepts that as a highlight and will assume that the rest of the pupil is continuing in that circle. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. As long as I put a bit more of the highlight out here, that'll be okay. So now I'm still probably going to go back over it again. It's just the trick with doing it like this and doing it from scratch is work little piece at a time and slowly, slowly build up the detail so you can see if what you're doing is working or if you're going to pretend that that didn't happen and you're going to move on and go over it and do it and take a different approach. So the idea is light's always going to come up from this angle up the top. So I'm going to try and keep that in mind as I'm doing my shading. Now, because I'm working at a very small scale, just to give you a bit of an idea, that's my finger. So it's quite small. Um, I don't need to draw in all of the details. I can just draw in enough to infer that detail and for the viewer's eye to kind of do the rest for me. Okay, so I'm just putting in now the cadmium orange. This is a great orange, it's a very rich orange. And then I'm going over, so that was in the polychromo. I'm now going over that with natural russet in the luminance. And like I said, I'm just slowly building in the layer for the eye. As I do the rest of the body, um, I may decide to come back in and tweak the eye a little bit more. Let's, we'll just see how we go, okay? Like this eye doesn't look finished to me, but I'm just thinking I might need to do a little bit more around it before I decide how to progress further because I want it to look shiny. So I'm just also deciding if I need to go in a bit further with this black and then creep in a bit on this highlight. If I'm going to do that, then I need to also darken over here because that shows that the highlight's stopping. But then the highlight goes over that. So yeah, I'll keep tweaking it. If I decide I need to change where the highlights are, I will. Okay, now I'm going to draw in a few of the rough lines of where the actual scale detail is. So I'm getting a pencil. I might change which colour I use. It's a little bit darker. I want to do a bit different colour. Let's try... So the whole point of what I'm doing now is to just outline where the scale detail is going to go. So on all the photos I've seen, they've got, and pretty much all monitors are like this as well, they've all got rings of scales around the eye like this. Now, so I'm going to draw them in. Now the thing I'm going to remember is I've got to remember the, the direction his face is. So um, he's looking in this direction. There's going to be depth here and here. Um, the point at the top of his eye here and the top of his eye here, pretend that there's a connecting line. And you want to pretend that that connecting line is the same way all the way across. So otherwise the proportions are going to look off. Okay, so this, this little tip is even if you're not comfortable yet drawing things from scratch, that little tip is just to ensure that even if you're copying off a photo, that you're aware that um, perspective really does matter 
to make sure that the animal just doesn't look wrong, <laughs> doesn't look off. Okay, there will be a video or two where I've got to decide if I'm going to do the entire animal then the background or am I going to do the background then the animal and so what I might do is I might do a bit of his head do the background on the test piece of paper again and then come back and do a bit of the background and keep adding as I go that way I sort of fill it in in this direction okay so I'm just trying to think so it's going to be a lot of me now talking out loud to myself while I'm planning out these scales and a lot of the scale detail is going to come in after I've done a lot of the base layers, I've just got to make sure I lay the foundation for those scales so that they look right. Okay, so I'm going to remove some of my outline with the kneadable eraser. There you go. And come in like this. So his jaw, his jaw comes out to just under his ear here, or about there. This is the hinge on his jaw. Okay. And comes in like that so there's a few things I'm thinking of right now my brain is trying to picture his skeleton underneath all of this just to ensure that I'm getting it kind of right his ear canal is here that's his ear so what happens is this ear canal goes in just a little bit so there's going to be a shadow I'll just do it with the black because I want it pretty dark so again light sources up the top so there'll be a shadow kind of a bit like this again I might change it if I think I need to it doesn't look 100% right. So shadow a bit like this. Okay. As it goes into the ear. And that's simply because it's a few millimetres in the ear. There'll be a film. And that's, you know, something that you obviously don't want to have rupture. <laughs> now, I'm not too sure physiologically if that's... that's I'm very sure it's just an, a membrane. It's not like the eardrum or anything like that, I don't think, but I can confirm that if I'm wrong and mistaken. All right, I'm just going to very lightly go over like this because I'm going to change the tone again. So at the moment I'm using pretty light pressure on this pastel mat because I'm going to be layering up quite a bit. So I'm going to just remove a bit more of that outline, make it a bit more softer. I didn't bother drawing in any of the patterns on the back because... Um, what I might do is I'm just, as long as I kind of, we do like, let's do a line. I'll do the rest of it when I actually focus on his back. But as long as I keep his spine, um, I keep aware of where the spine is and where other markers are, the markings should look okay and should look realistic once I'm done. Okay. So I'm just debating, do I keep drawing in, I'm just wondering, do I keep drawing in the lines? Or should I just start shading? Um, I need to draw in a little bit more because there's still a few markings. I'm looking at a couple of photos. The thing is, I think the photo, the reference photos I've got, they're all, um, some of them are different aged individuals. I think some of them from looking at the shape of their heads, um, as in the proportion of the snout and the eyes, as well as the pattern on their, um, the markings. I'm thinking some of them are juvenile. Okay, so let's give you a few details. Um, they also have different markings, obviously. So some of them have got, like, there's one I've got where there's a spot on his head. There's another one where there's no spots on the head um, except for just a few lines like this. So this is where I've got to decide um, which markings I'm going to sort of use because some markings are indicative of the actual species and then other markings are unique to each individual and, you know, can differ between if different individuals. All right. I think I should be safe to do the base layers because I'm just having a look now. They all do seem to have a few dark lines here. But let's get started on the base layers. So for the base layers, let's go the ivory uh, very lightly under the jaw. You can see it looks quite grainy at the moment and we're going to get rid of that graininess. Get the wheat. Go over it again, and now I'm just trying to think. I need that one's so I was looking at this one, that's a bit too bright. I need to go a more subdued. So let's try light aqua in the Derwent Light Fast. And at the moment, I'm just getting the base layers down. 
Okay, we're going to do the whole jaw. I'm just trying to see, because they seem to have almost a yellow tinge. Almost all of them have this sort of yellow tinge to the shadowing under their jaw. So I'm just going to kind of put this in. You can see it's quite grainy at the moment. I'm going to have to smooth it out. And then with a bit more work, it'll gradually get less grainy. Okay. So we'll keep going over with this. So I'm just alternating between the different pencils. Now, I'm just trying to think, because I did do a practice on the swatch, on the test piece of scrap pastel mat that I have. And yeah, we're just going through here like this. Cool, so I'm just gonna keep alternating. Um, it's I'm gonna try my best to talk about what I'm doing. Sometimes it might be a bit hard when I'm literally concentrating because I'm my brain's doing a few different things at once to um, decide the best path to take. So at the moment I'm trying to envision envision the future um, lighting. And at the moment I'm using the luminance, what's this one? Olive brown 50%. So I've got about 30, maybe 25, 30. I haven't actually counted them properly, but um, about 25 or 30 pencils I narrowed down from that initial lot from the last video. Um, I probably will use most of them. There'll be a few that I may decide I don't end up needing. But yeah, at the moment I'm just layering this up. And yeah, this is a, still a bit of an experiment of how I'm going to record this series this is in lieu of the fact that um it's i haven't really been able to do a live session just because with um having a young baby and a toddler that needs my attention there's uh, i it's very difficult for me to know in advance when i'm going to have time to sit down undisturbed to do that if you watched all of my last video um i understand there'll be people who skipped it that's totally fine but if you watched all of my last video, there were a few moments that I had a few interruptions simply because I had um, my three-month-old, three-and-a-half-month-old with me. She was pretty good for most of it. She was either sleeping for most or she was happy for me to hold her while I was drawing. And then I had my almost three-year-old, two-and-a-bit-year-old. She was just playing. She was mostly playing in the living room, entertaining herself with her toy kitchen, make playing shop. And there was a few times that um, I stopped because she was wanting to talk with me and I don't want to ignore her or tell her to go away. I'll stop what I'm doing, see what she has to talk about, especially since I'm the one home with her. It's like I don't want to be sending her off saying mummy's busy because um, she's two. She doesn't 100% understand that just yet and that's not fair on her to make her feel abandoned so there was a few times that I stopped the video to get her some food or to join in playing with her and so the video is only I think 25 minutes long or something like that the last video but that was probably filmed over maybe an hour um, and that's pretty much the only drawing time I got in yesterday um, which is fine that's just the reality but yeah, um, on that note, I had a few, I asked people to comment any questions that they would have for me. One person um, asked about how do I juggle things like that when I've got kids, um, young, very especially young children like a toddler and an infant. And the reality is I've had to, um, in advance, I knew that this was going to happen. I just made sure that I didn't fill my calendar up too much. So I'm taking less bookings now. I've actually turned down a lot of bookings now. Um, I've still got a real weak spot when it comes to reptiles, especially if someone gives me a spider or invertebrates. So um, things that are not normally on my um, – that I don't normally get asked for, I have a hard, harder time of saying no at the moment. But, um, yeah, basically I've had to slow down what I take and turn a lot of people away. I'll still listen to what people say and say and tell them the situation and ask are they okay to wait for this month but the idea is I'm giving myself a lot of room and time to work on things because as far as I'm concerned my family comes first my kids come first and I don't ever want them to feel like I'm putting you know my work above them um, because 
I can work around that. But yeah, so my eldest daughter, who's going to be three in a few months, a couple of months, she's currently in daycare um, a few days a week. So I've got her on the weekends and on Friday she's home. And then if the daycare's like, so yesterday, the reason she was home was um, daycare lady was sick. So I had her home for the day. So in situations like that where the daycare lady's sick or at the moment with the COVID situation, occasionally there's been times where um, our COVID restrictions have altered and I've kept her home or places have shut down. But, yeah, normally the way I work is um, and how I juggle things is she's in daycare. So I try to do this kind of work while she's in daycare. So my routine normally is in the morning I get housework done. I might put a load of washing on, all that kind of thing. And then while that's going, I will do some work if I'm able to it. However, having said that, I also have a baby. And occasionally she has not wanted me to sit down and do work. She's been wanting to be up and held and that's totally fine. So I might give her some attention. Um, but if she's sleeping, so right now my daughter, my eldest daughter is at daycare and my youngest daughter is currently sleeping and I've already done the dishes. I still have a whole pile of laundry to fold up, but um, I got through a lot of it last night. But yeah, so it's just a, it's just a constant juggling act and about being transparent with clients. So this is a commission I'm doing right now. Um, and he's aware of the situation. So he was given the time slot of more like closer to March. Um, I actually was pretty good on finishing things early for January, February. So I'm starting this early because um, I can. And this also gives me a more wiggle room if um, I get interruptions in the next few weeks. So I'm not stressed and not feeling like I'm letting people down. But yeah, I think I've waffled on enough on that. But yeah, I think in terms of trying to organize your time, where appropriate and where possible, it's. I think it really comes down to um, being able to anticipate what the likelihood of interruptions. Um, it's probably that's an awkward way of explaining it. But let's try and find, try and um, work out if there's likely to be any interruptions on your horizons. And plan around it. Now, you obviously can't, you can't anticipate things that are obviously out of your, you know, if you can't anticipate it, that's the whole point. You can't anticipate it. Um, So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you think there's a good chance you're going to have interruptions, plan around it. Space your timing out. Don't try to give yourself a tight timeline give yourself wiggle room for errors and for delays and things like that and that's what I've done I've given myself lots of wiggle room and lots of time and space to plan things out in case um, I get further delays it just so happened that over February and January it ran pretty smoothly which was why I was able to get things done quicker because as far as I'm concerned, it's a benefit if I can get things done quicker. That's a bonus. You don't want a situation where you assume you'll get it done quicker and then you find out problems come up and you're now screwed and stressed and, you know, everything's not working out the way you planned and, yeah, disaster. Very stressful then. So you don't want that. Okay, so what I'm now doing, I'm just going to do like a, a general few base layers. I'll come back to his jaw. Yeah. But yeah, it's as far as I'm concerned, I don't want my kids to ever feel like, you know, mummy's busy now, go away. If there's another adult around, I will confirm with that adult if they're okay to also, you know, we'll negotiate. Um <laughs> you know, who can do stuff, maybe one will take them to the park. But the reality is if I really need time for myself to get something done, then some I'll get like my husband or someone to take take them to the park because the point is I don't ever want my kids to feel like they're being rejected. And at two years old, that's what she feels like. If I'm telling her to go away, as far as a two-year-old's concerned, they've just been rejected by mum. That's just the reality of it. 
and I don't want her to feel that way. It's not about, I've had people say, oh, she needs to learn X, Y, Z. Well, yeah, when she's old enough to compute that and understand that and reason that she's not at this age. She is too young to understand that. She barely understands tomorrow. (laughs) If I say to her, no, we're going to the park tomorrow, she barely understands that concept. So trying to reason with a two-year-old that I will do this with you later, that's not what she hears. She hears no. She hears no, mummy's not going to do this with you. So like I said, I'm the adult. It's my responsibility to um, find, uh, make sure that she's entertained if I'm in a situation where I actually do need to have me time and get something done. So I have to work on my tax or I've got something done. So you do that when she's not around. I do that when she's not around and or I've got an, like whether it's because she's at daycare or there's another adult to take her to the park and make her not feel like she's being left alone. Yeah. That's a combination of my personal views and from what I went through with psych. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's another question. I had someone ask me um, what my background is. I've talked about it a little bit so I've chopped and changed a bit Um, my initial plan after leaving high school was um, to go into biomed or to go into pediatrics and I didn't get into medicine so I got into biomed with the idea to change Um, then I decided or more I realized I don't do well with other people being upset and stressed which is probably going to happen quite a bit if you're dealing with sick kids So I tweaked my course um, at uni and I'm now a qualified science teacher. So in terms of education, I've got a psych degree and a biology um, degree. I've got to double check my actual degree to see what it actually labels. Basically it's biology, Um, biological sciences. I taught, well, I was an instructor at Deakin University here in Victoria taught two units under two unit chairs so one was a more um, human physiology unit and the other one was a zoology unit was a comparative physiology unit where we mostly was mostly focused on vertebrates so like reptiles and mammals and things but we did cover invertebrates which is not something I'm as familiar with so I was the kind of instructor who was just brushing up on my knowledge from the book before going to class and I was pretty open with my students to say I am not an expert when it comes to invertebrates so I have my book out here to assist me and my colleague (laughs) will the answer is more into reptile uh, sorry more into insects and bugs so he was able to help the students a bit more on that but yeah so I taught at Deakin University um, during my master's and that the master's I was completing at at that time was to be a secondary teacher which I still am qualified to do. I'm currently on leave because of having my baby and I'm doing this because I can and because I enjoy it. And I've always enjoyed kind of doing drawing and stuff. So right now you've been watching me. I've just been layering up um, the different sections. So it's just repeat process. I'm la- I'm going between this is luminance um, middle vertebris 713. And I'm doing it in very small sections simply because that's how I'm working out the best way to um, layer this up. I can hear someone waking up. I'll go deal with her soon. Right. So I can't remember if I said earlier because um, I've had to pause the video to feed my daughter again. Um, But yeah, this will be a bit of an experiment, how I do these videos. So um, my plan at the moment is to talk like I did, I have been so far. And it could be talking about what I'm doing, um, answering questions, whether people have asked me them on Facebook or they've asked me through Instagram or in the comment section below or, you know, if there's not much to talk about and you guys just want to see a bit more of the process, I might either directly cut, I might just show time lapses, time lapse sections, or we'll honestly just make cuts. There'll be sections where I'm doing work and then you'll just see edited cuts because the reality is this piece is going to take hours and I'm sure there are some people who want to see that 
in its entirety but I'm also well aware that there'll be others who just want to see the highlight bits or they want to see you know sections of it they they don't mind skipping bits of it um, and not spending literally like 30 hours on something so this will be a evolving process which I mentioned in the last video which I'm happy to listen to people's feedback hear what people had to say about that so yeah, I might just keep layering these in. If um, I might just, this will be cutting probably soon to a time lapse. If anyone does want me not to do this in the future and you want me to talk a little bit more, just let me know in the comments what exactly you want me to be saying. Um, I can, you know, so far I've mentioned a lot of the colors in the last video. Um, but yeah, this is really just me layering them in a bit at a time. So what I might do is I'll cut to a quick time lapse of me just layering the base layers in as I've been doing and then I will come out of it when I change what I'm doing to explain the new process. So I thought I'd just come out of the time lapse really quickly because I just realized this is um, I'm already slightly doing a new technique. So what I'm now doing is as I'm layering the colors up, I'm slowly um, putting the colors down in sort of the pattern of where the scale lines are going to be. So here I'm using the light Malachite 181 in the luminance and I've done a base, a few base layers of lighter colors such as the buff titanium and luminance and the ivory and the polychromo and I think wheat in the derwent I did a bit up here as well. But over the top now I'm going over it in this light malachite and I'm just putting in now where it's a little bit more of that bluey green kind of color in there around their face. So I'm still following this eye line where I'm doing these kind of half circle kind of areas and leaving some spaces but as I come around here to the nose the snout I'm just doing kind of up uh, left right little kind of patterns and most of his nose I'm actually filling in with this I'm leaving a bit of a white lip um, because I'll do that in a little bit more of a white or a creamy color so I'll come in with a derwent again this is the wheat color and I'm just going to fill in a little bit more. I've sort of cut, gone over where his lip line is because what I might do is I'll be going back over that in the detail that you see with the scales. Ooh, little one's waking up again. But, yeah, so. <laughs> All right, I'll be back. All right, so I have my daughter sitting on my lap now. Um, she is well and truly awake and we'll see if I can continue doing this as a narration while she's here. So I'll just talk you through what I'm doing now. So now I'm just going to, I've decided just to do a bit of a base, very light base layer. Um, at the moment I'm not even worrying about scale details. Like that's not even my concern at the moment because pastel matte is so good at taking layers that as long as I keep these initial layers light, I should be fine to add the um, this the scale details later on top. So, for instance, here it's actually got a lot of dark. He's got like a dark band here. Um, so I'm just doing the light green, which shows through those scales um, as like a base kind of layer. So this is polychromo light with yellow green. It's a really lovely green. Um, and then what I'm going to do is even that out into where I've done the, the lighter colors. <laughs> um, now I'm going to get this yellow. The only reason I got this bright yellow was for this purpose, which was to add a little bit of a yellow tinge to the base layers here. Okay, so I'm going to put that through. Again, really super light. Um, I use a firmer pressure on the more um, the different type of papers that I use. So if I'm using something like a cotton um, cotton rag or something like that, like the Art Spectrum or Canson Drawing or something like that, 
I would use firmer pressure in places with pastel oh. mat. Um, you've got to be pretty light. So more of that yellow. Now here under his neck, I'm going to add some of that yellow in. And you'll notice that as I'm layering it, that grain in, the graininess that you can see here will slowly disappear like over here as I keep going in. If some, if anyone's struggling on how to use pastel mat, I mean, this is the first time I've used the light blue I've used. Um, I think from memory it was the green or the, and I've used one of the greys. Um, not the anthracite, the another grey. Um, they were fine. They're pretty similar to this actually. I think one of them was a bit grittier. Um, I can't remember which one it was. It was a while ago now. But yeah, it's the first time I've used the light blue pastel mat. And so I'm not exactly an expert, but if anyone does want me to take you through how to do it, I'm happy to do that. There's also some great other YouTubers who can um, explain this that have been doing it longer than I have and probably, oh yes, tell me all about it, um, probably have a lot more experience than me. All right, so I'm just going to keep on layering what I was doing before and I'll see you back after the time lapse. done a few dots for the scales now I don't know if I'm going to edit this out or not but the previous video I accidentally had the um, orientation the wrong way so it's either going to be included if I can fix it or you just won't see it but um, just in case I delete it I'll just explain what I was doing so I talked a little bit about the eye in that bit but i um, also talking about that I've done and there still is a little bit of graininess to the base layers but now I'm going in with the um, cold grey 6 to do a bit more of the actual detailing on the scale. So it's a sharp cold grey 6. And I'm doing a combination of just dots. So like here, I'll darken some of these up a little bit. So there's the dots um, for the scales around the eye. And because I've drawn that base layer of the kind of creamy yellow in, um, that's what shows through and it still shows it sort of looks quite detailed then coming up around the ear I'm now going to darken the ear up a little bit now I just do random lines I'll show I allow some of that um, lighter gray to show through just to add a little bit of depth to the ear now I'm coming with the black again and just do a darker ring just for the to kind of show that the ear canal kind of goes in just a little bit well, at least I hope it shows that um, yeah so we'll do a few more details around here and I'm I'm not being super careful like you know I've worked out from the references that a lot of this is going to be different for each individual um, reptile and then there are some markings that are indicative of that particular species 
So the markings that are indicative of the species, I'm going to try and keep in that pattern like the stripe here on the eye. That seems to be um, common in a few different individuals. So that must be like a trait for that species. But then there's other things like how many spots are on the head that differ between each one. So let's go here. Let's go around the eye. So reptiles tend to at least um, monitors and quite a few different skink species all have a similar thing where they've got these scales that loop around in a certain way around the eye. I think I've done that a bit too dark, so let's try and lift off some of this. Just a little bit. Um, I'm going to go over that in the Arctic. And it doesn't matter if you can still see it underneath. It's, you know, there's scales there anyway, so you can see that. Um, but, yeah, what I was saying is they seem to follow this same pattern of having, like, a ring around the eye. Okay, I'm going to darken, darken this base bit up with the Van Dyke Brown in the Polychromo. Okay, so now we're going to get the grey. This is cold grey 4 to do a few more rings around that eye, just subtle rings. Again, you don't want to look in cartoony, so you only... You don't need super dark lines. Um, and then I'm just going to do little circles, filling in those lines. And that's all you need, just these little circles. And when you're drawing reptiles, it's just a very long process of doing all of these scales. So now I'm just going to draw random shapes. They're not quite circles. They're odd shapes up here around the top of the eye. Okay, this is probably the darkest I would want to draw these. Um, it's borderline coming onto too dark because you don't need them that obvious. So I'm going to change colors to this blue again. This is the cobalt green. I say it's still more blue in comparison to some of these other colors here I've got. Okay, buff titanium just to kind of smooth things out a little bit. And I'm going to come in with the cobalt, uh, not cobalt, sorry, the cold grey too. Blend that. And yeah, I just keep repeating the process. I jump all over the place. I'm already well aware that I do that. Let's change colours again. Um, that's just my brain keeps, like I'll see one thing and then I jump to something different. All right, because that's darker, I need to go a little bit darker. There we go. So it's still not super dark, but it's dark enough um, for the scales to be a bit more obvious. So I'm going to draw a bunch of circles here. And then what I'm going to do is come in with those uh, the dark gray, uh, cold gray six and draw the actual dots of the markings on those scales. So this is the outline for the scales like this. Very light outline. This is the Helio Turquoise. And then now I'm coming with the Cold Grey 6. And this is the pattern I'll be doing. So there's a few dots underneath. A few more dots. They go in like a line. Yeah. And we'll finish up soon because I've been going for quite a while. And I think I've got a fair bit of the head done. I'll be doing a bit more off camera. Yeah, I hope this has been enjoyable. Um, again, please communicate with me. <laughs> Let me know. Um, I'm talking to people who see this on Facebook as well as people who are watching on YouTube. Yeah, let me know. Let me know how to tweak and change things or what's working for you. Obviously, I can't make everybody happy, but I'm wanting to take on board people's suggestions um, as best I can. Okay, so I'm just tweaking some of these colours just a little bit. That's super yellow now, so I'm going to dull it down. But yeah, I'd like to take on board what people want and um, do what I can to help. So yeah, thanks for watching everybody.